Summer of the Monkeys by Wilson Rawls, Chapter 1 Up until I was fourteen years old, no boy on earth could have been happier. I didn't have a worry in the world. In fact, I was beginning to think it wasn't going to be hard at all for me to grow up. But just when things were really looking good for me, something happened. I got mixed up with a bunch of monkeys, and all of my happiness flew right out of the window. Those monkeys all but drove me out of my mind. If I had kept this monkey trouble to myself, I don't think it would have amounted to much, but I got my grandpa mixed up in it. I felt pretty bad about it because grandpa was my pal, and all he was trying to do was help me. I even coaxed Rowdy, my old blue tick hound, into helping me with this monkey trouble. He came out of the mess worse than grandpa and I did. Rowdy got so disgusted with me, monkeys, and everything in general, he wouldn't come out from under the house when I called him. It was in the late 1800s, the best I can remember. Anyhow, at the time, we were living in a brand new country that had just been opened up for settlement. The farm we lived in was called Cherokee Land because it was smack dab in the middle of the Cherokee Nation. It lay in a strip of the foothills of the Ozark, from the foothills of the Ozark Mountains to the banks of the Illinois River in northeastern Oklahoma. This was the last place in the world that anyone would expect to find a bunch of monkeys. I wasn't much bigger than a young possum when Mama and Papa settled on the land, but after I grew up a little, Papa told me all about it, how he and Mama hadn't been married very long and were sharecropping in Missouri. They were unhappy, too, because in those days, being a sharecropper was just about as bad as being a hog thief. Everybody looked down on you. Mama and Papa were young and proud, and to have people look down on them was almost more than they could stand. They stayed to themselves, kept on sharecropping and saving every dollar they could, hoping that some day they could buy a farm for their own. Just when things were looking pretty good for Mama and Papa, something happened. Mama hauled off and had twins. My little sister Daisy and me. Papa said I was born first, and he never saw a healthier boy. I was as pink as a sunburnt huckleberry and as lively as a young squirrel in a corn crib. It was different with Daisy, though. Somewhere along the line, something went wrong, and she was born with her right leg all twisted up. The doctor said there wasn't much wrong with Daisy's old leg. It had something to do with the muscles. Leaders, things like that, being all tangled up. He said there were doctors in Oklahoma City that could take a crippled leg and straighten it out as straight as a ramrod. This would cost quite a bit of money, though, and money was the one thing Mama and Papa didn't have. Mama cried a lot in those days, and she prayed a lot, too. But nothing seemed to do any good. It was bad enough to be stuck there with that sharecropper's farm, but to have a little daughter and a twisted leg and not be able to do anything for her hurt worst of all. Then one day, right out of a clear blue sky, Mama got a letter from Grandpa. She read it, and her face turned as white as the bark on a sycamore tree. She sat right down on the dirt floor of our sod house and started laughing and crying all at the same time. Papa said that after he had read the letter, it was all he could do to keep from bawling a little too. Grandpa and Grandma were living down in the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. They owned one of those big old country stores that had everything in it. Grandpa wasn't only a storekeeper, he was a trader too, and a good one. Papa always said that Grandpa was the only honest trader he, had, he ever knew. He could trade a terrapin out of his shell. In his letter, Grandpa told Mama and Papa that he had done some trading with a Cherokee Indian for 60 acres of virgin land, and that it was theirs if they wanted it. All they had to do was come down and make a farm out of it. They could pay him for it any way they wanted to. Well, the way Mama was carrying on, there wasn't but one thing Papa could do. The next morning, before the roosters started crowing, he took what money they had saved and headed for town. He bought a team of big red Mississippi mules and a covered wagon. Then he bought a turning plow, some seed corn, and a milk cow. This took about all the money he had. It was way in the night when Papa got back home. Mama hadn't even gone to bed. She had everything they owned packed and was ready to go. They were both so eager to get away from that sharecropping farm that they started, lo they started loading the wagon by moonlight. The last thing Papa did was to make a two-baby cradle. 
He took Mama's old wash tub and tied a short piece of rope to each handle to give the cradle a little bit of bounce. He tied the ropes to two cultivator springs and hung the whole contraption on the boughs inside the covered wagon. Mama thought the old wash tub was the best baby cradle she had ever seen. She filled it with about half full of corn shucks and quilts and then put Daisy and me down in it. After taking one last look at the sod house, Papa cracked the whip and they left Missouri for Oklahoma Territory. When Papa took me to the when Papa told me that part of the story, he laughed and said, If anyone ever asks you how we got from, how you got from Missouri to the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, just tell them that you rode in a wash tub every inch of the way. The day they reached Grandpa's store, Papa was just about all, all in and had his mind set on sleeping in one of Grandma's feather beds. Mama wouldn't listen to that kind of talk at all. She had waited so long for a farm of her own, she was bound and determined to spend the night on her own land. Grandma tried to talk some sense into Mama. She told her that the land was only three miles down the river, and it certainly wasn't going to run away. They could stay all night with them, rest up, and go on the next day. Mama puffed up like a setting hen in a hailstorm. Nothing Grandma or Grandpa said changed her mind. She told Papa that he could stay there if he wanted to. She'd just take Daisy and me and go on by herself. Papa knew better than to open his mouth, because once Mama had made up her mind like that, she wouldn't have budged an inch from a buzzing, ra from a buzzing rattler. There wasn't but one thing he could do. He just climbed back in the wagon, unwrapped the check lines from the brake, and said, Get up to those old Missouri mules. It was in the twilight of evening when Mama and Papa reached the land of their dreams. They camped for the night in a grove of tall white sycamores right on the bank of the Illinois River. Papa said that as long as he lived, he would never forget that night. It seemed to him that they were being welcomed by everything, by every living thing in those Cherokee bottoms. Whippoorwills were calling out, and night hawks were crying as they dipped and darted through the starlit sky. Bullfrogs and hoot owls were jarring the ground with their deep voices. Even the little speckled tree frogs and katydids and the crickets were chirping with their nickels worth of welcome music. A big grinning Ozark moon crawled out of nowhere and seemed to say, Hi, neighbor, I've been looking for you. It gets kind of lonesome out here. Welcome to the land of the Cherokee. Papa said Mama was so taken by all of that beauty, she seemed to be hypnotized. <coughs> she just stood there in the moonlight with a warm little smile on her face, staring out over the river, her black eyes growing like black haws in the morning dew. Finally, she gave a deep sigh, just as if she had dropped something heavy from her shoulders. Then spreading her arms out wide, she said in a low voice, It's the work of the Lord, that's what it is. Just think, all of this is ours, 60 acres of it. Papa said he was feeling so good that he felt he could have walked right out on the waters of the river just as Jesus did when he walked on the waters of the sea. Mama was a little woman, barely tipping the scales at 100 pounds, but what she lacked in height and weight she made up in strength and spirit, pulling her end of a cross-cut saw and swinging the heavy blade of a double-bided axe. She helped Papa clear the land. Mama let Papa pick the spot for our log house. This wasn't an easy chore for her. She walked all over the sixty acres, looking and looking. Finally, she found the very spot she wanted and put her foot down. It was in the foothills overlooking the river bottoms, in the mouth of the little blue canyon. In the mouth of a little blue canyon. I grew up on that Cherokee farm and was just about as wild as the gray squirrels in the sycamore trees and as free as the red-tailed hawks that wield, that weave their cries in the Ozark skies. I had a dandy pocket knife and a darn good dog. That was about all a boy could hope for in those days. My little sister Daisy grew up too, but not like I did. It seemed as if that old leg of hers held her growing back. Each year it got worse and worse. The foot part kept twisting and twisting until finally she couldn't walk on it at all. That's when Papa made a crutch for her, out of a red oak limb with a fork in one end. 
The way Daisy could zip around on that old homemade crutch was something to see. She could get around on it just about as well as I could on two straight legs. It was always a mystery to me how my little sister could be so happy and so full of life with an old twisted leg like that. She was always laughing and singing and hopping around on that old crutch just as if she didn't have a worry in the world. Her one big delight was getting me all riled up by poking fun at me. She never overlooked an opportunity, and it seemed that these opportunities came about every 15 minutes. Up on the hillside from our house, under a huge red oak tree, Daisy had a playhouse. From early spring until late fall, practically all her time was spent there. I didn't like to mess around Daisy's playhouse. Every time I went up there, I had a guilty feeling like maybe I shouldn't be there. She had all kinds of girl stuff sitting around, corn shuck dolls, mud pies, and pretty bottles. She treasured every tin can that came to our home. In each one, some kind of wildflower peeked out. At one end of her playhouse, Daisy had built a little altar. She had made a cross by tying two grapevines together and covering them with tin foil. The face of Christ was there, too. Daisy had molded it from red clay. For the eyes, she had pressed blue shells from a hatched-out robin's nest into the soft clay. She had covered the crown with moss to resemble hair. When Mama discovered that the moss was actually growing in the soft clay, she told everyone in the hills about it. People came from miles around to see the miracle. I never saw anything like it. It was pretty around Daisy's playhouse, especially in the early spring when the dog weeds, red buds, and mountain flowers were blooming. Little warm breezes would whisper down from the green, rugged hills, and the air would be so full of sweet smells it would make your nose tickle and burn. If you closed your eyes and filled your lungs full of that sweet smell and stuff, your head would get as light as a hummingbird's feather and feel as if it were going to sail away by itself. Daisy was never alone in her playhouse. She had all kinds of little friends. Big fat bunnies, red squirrels, and chipmunks would come right up to her and eat from her hand. She wouldn't be in her playhouse five minutes until all kind of wild birds would come winging in from the mountains. They would sit around in the bushes and sing so happy and loud that the mountains would ring with their birdie songs. Sometimes they would even light on her shoulders. I never could understand how my little sister made friends with the birds and the animals. I couldn't get within a mile of anything that had hair or feathers on it. Daisy said it was because I was a boy and was catching things all the time. One morning, in early spring, Papa came in from doing the chores with an empty milk bucket in his hand. He looked grouchy and didn't even say good morning to any of us. This was so unusual that right away Mama knew something was wrong. From the cook stove where she was fixing our breakfast, Mama smiled and said, Knowing how desperate you are to get the plant done, I'd say it was going to rain. No, Papa said in a disgusted voice. It's not going to rain. Sally Gooden's gone again. Sally Gooden was our crazy old milk cow. Oh, no, Mama exclaimed. Not again. I can't understand that cow, Papa said, shaking his head. Just last week I put an extra rail on the pasture fence. It didn't do any good, though. She sailed over it as if it wasn't even there. Turning to me, Papa said, Jay Barry, you'll have to find her. That's all there is to it. It's wild onion time, and if she gets a belly full of those, her milk won't be any good for days. We can't do without milk and butter. When Papa asked me to do important things like that, it made me feel just as big as one of those Ozark mountains in our log around our log house. I puffed out my chest and said, I'll find Sally Gooden, Papa. She's probably down in the river bottoms. That's where I usually find her. It seemed that Papa and I never could hold a man-to-man conversation without Mama getting all worked up, especially if, I, if we were talking about my going down to the river bottoms. Mama frowned and said, That crazy old cow? Anyhow, Jay Barry, you be careful. I worry every time you go down in those bottoms. Worry? I said big-eyed. Why, Mama? What do you have to worry for? I've been all over those bottoms. You know that. I know, Mama said. But I worry just the same. It's no place for a 14-year-old boy. Why, it's a regular jungle down there. You can't see ten feet in any direction. And there are snakes, wild hogs, and goodness knows what all. We'll stop there.